matter who it is, people have actually been made to work together and to come up with some kind of proper plan um, for deer management in urban areas because of people like yourselves, people like David, who've headed it up and said this is really important. So there's a, an interesting morning ahead. I'll just run through the agenda for you for those that have forgotten it. Um, <laughs> we have Andrew Treadaway from Barney College who's going to talk about the need for urban deer management standards and that's the presentation here. We have Professor James Simpson from the University of Edinburgh uh, who's going to talk about injuries in urban deer. And then this most important bit, which is the coffee and sandwiches from these great guys here. Uh, Professor Rory Putman of the University of Glasgow um, will be speaking after the coffee break, and Ben Harrower, Wildlife Ranger Manager from the Forestry Commission. Then we'll hear from David Correll himself. Um, Five minutes. <laughs> questions <laughs> in break. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me, and I'll pass straight on to the first item on the agenda. Uh, for some introductory words and background um, to the LPNS. Lowland Deer Network Scotland, Richard Cook. <laughs> the Lowland Deer Network is very pleased to be um, asked to back this event. Um, the South Lancashire Deer Management Group are fantastic in the way that they set up last year's event going on to this one. And uh, it's the first time I've heard of a deer event being ever sold to the extent that almost <laughs> twice as many people as are here wanted to be here. So that says something. Um, yeah, can I read my writing? That's always a big question. Um, so th this this event is really designed. It's, it, uh, the, the event you had last year initially was designed for people who knew very little about deer management but were curious and wanted to find out. But the fact that people who came, I think we're right saying, were mostly a number of people here and other people who already know what they're doing um, and are very much the converted. So this year's event is, is targeted more at people who are already experienced deer managers, but um, are particularly interested or, or require to think particularly about the special issues that arise in managing deer in the urban environment. Um, I work for SRUC Barn Campus. My sort of day-to-day -day job is forestry and arboriculture. The deer side comes in because for the well since about 2000, I've been involved in the. DSC level 1s and 2s, teaching that, assessing it, and internally verifying it. Um, I've also helped uh, Davy in his booklet on um, urban deer control. So that's where I stand in this. And he, <coughs> um, South Lancashire um, Deer Management Group, asked me to give a short talk on how I see urban deer. Okay, so I want to give a bit of a sort of background as I see it. So I think the first thing is to understand what we have here. So we've got so the deer species in Scotland, we've got red deer, roe deer, fallow deer, and seeker deer. Um, at present, the most commonest one, of course, in urban settings is the roe deer in Scotland. We do know that red deer, they can be um, found in uh, people's gardens, uh, houses, villages, stuff like that. So there is instances of that. Generally in the UK, uh, roe and munjet are the common deers in urban areas, so if we look at the whole picture, okay? Um, if we look at some sort of statistics, in England, the outskirts of Sheffield, there's been about 150 uh, reported sightings of red deer. That was in 2008, and you compare that to 1980, where there was only three. Uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, Jimmy Simpson, and I'm a veterinary surgeon, and a based at the Royal Dick Veterinary College in Edinburgh. And I'm also a stalker, uh, an amateur stalker, not a professional stalker. So I have two kind of camps from which I'm talking from. And I'm also involved in uh, the Scottish Deer Project, which you may at some point want to have a look at at the internet, um, because what we're interested in doing is developing our knowledge on wild deer diseases in Scotland. Uh, and it's been a really tremendous project because people like yourselves have been inputting to it and we've already developed a tremendous amount of knowledge on the subject of deer diseases in Scotland. However, depending on which um, of the agendas you looked at this morning, uh, my talk is actually going to be based on diseases of deer which you may encounter uh, perhaps in, in an urban setting. So I'm entitled to talk <coughs> to your shot road deer uh, and is it now fit for the food chain? And, and obviously, as stalkers, our, our, our role is to check 
the carcass and make sure that it's free of diseases. And that's really going to be the focus of my talk this morning. So, <coughs> the first thing that we really want to do when we've shot the road here um, is to make sure that there are no notifiable diseases present. Uh, and this is actually the current up-to-date list of notifiable diseases for deer in the United Kingdom uh, supplied to me by DEFRA just recently. Some of them will be very familiar to you, others will be less familiar to you. Some of them aren't even in the country yet, so chronic wasting disease uh, and epizootic uh, hemorrhagic disease don't even exist in the country, but they're notifiable because the risk is very high that they may come into the country, and it's our job to make sure that we know about them. So it is important for you to, to know about those, and I'm going to touch on the more common ones as we go through the talk this morning. You can achieve contraceptive for ungulates. It's a waste of time trying to sterilise males. And again, a cautionary tale in a deer park where I used to work. They were worried as a fallow deer park. They had a very much scattered fawning season and they were losing a lot of fawns to foxes and also simple curiosity from other females going over to look at the latest fawn because there was only one. So what they did was they caught up all the males and they took them out and they put them all back in again, bang, first of September because then they would get a synchronised rut and synchronised fawning or so they thought. They'd missed one pricket who had very short spikes and they hadn't seen him. And on his own, he impregnated 230 adult females. <laughs> so you're wasting your time trying to sterilise males, unless you get the whole lot of them. And even for females, you have to effectively contracept, there is such a word I checked, you have effectively to contracept in excess of 80% of the population if you are going to have an effect on population size in the long term. <coughs> So culling, when we uh, do culling, lowering the profile, I'm sure some of this will be repeated in the afternoon um, with some of the things that will be mentioned. But I mean, the use of ISIS for us is important and location. Um, I'll touch on something just now, just because it happened last week. I went just to a site in passing, because I had two ISIS something, it's a very uh, deprived area. And uh, I'd sort of gotten away with the ISIS being there, although I'd seen a poacher there twice and uh, phoned the police suspicious activity. I mean, in one case, one time I saw him, he was walking about with his hyper air rifle. When he saw me, he put a pallet clap over his face and just continued walking. <laughs> so I think he started to clock me and what I was doing. Um, so anyway, I went there and I had the two high seats up and I had a camera as well set up to look over one of the high seats. I think because the police have been after him twice now, um, I went there last week and the camera box, the belt box was smashed open, the camera missing. I went to the high seat and uh, there's a big I chain them all, you have to chain them. Um, if, if you're leaving them out for any given time, if it's not suitable for you to take it in on the day, which is the ideal scenario, if you're leaving it for a short period of time, um, yeah, then do that. The, the chain had a the nylon material around it that had been slashed with a knife. So I thought, well, at least I've stolen my high seat, better take it in because they're on it. Went to the other high seat location and it was like, shoot, shoot. They cut the tree down, the tree was gone. So <laughs> I lost a high seat and a camera. So the moral is be very careful, but it might get touched on there. I think I've only got a few minutes left. So professional presentable, so that's not like running about like Rambo, you know, uh, camo rolling into undergrowth. If you see someone, you know, just. You know, I uh, don't use camouflage at all. Go up and be as approachable as possible. Um, as uh, well, do what you need to, basically. Um, the street moderators, row sacks, and um, as I said, when we use the uh, uh, like we see row sacks later, exclusion zones as well. There's the use of a row sack, for example. Don't shoot in the snow to avoid this. <coughs> uh, this would be actually in the early days. I shot these two up in the bank and and uh, genuinely just both dropped in the spot but slid down this hill. It's like quite a hard crust and I was on the footpath. So this was a footpath that was quite busy and I left that. So that was lesson learned. That was about four years ago. So um, I mean this wasn't an urban urban environment but you can see how that would translate. And I still get complaints with uh, 
if it's still near enough to the path and there is a bit of snow on the areas that you wouldn't call urban, the sort of rural will still get complaints about, oh, the massacre and one bit of the flood looks bigger. But as an urban deer manager, um, it's not just about shooting the deer, it's about the people who are around the area. So, what do the city public think of deer? What do they think of deer managers? What do the public think of deer management? Why do they have these perceptions? How can we change these perceptions for the better? How do we give confidence to the public department who will need deer managers to a very high standard in the future? So, we'll start with the first one. Walt Disney, the man himself, but um, the general public, um, certainly the city public, view it here right, as a beautiful creature that they love to see. And they also believe it's extremely rare. I spoke to people where I control the deer, and they actually say that they didn't know there was any deer in the area. So, um, you know, there's a few, uh, a few pictures there, people taking their dog for a walk, taking deer, and uh, this was at the back of Easter House, I think it was 14 or 15 in that picture, the people at the chapel didn't even know deer existed. So, what do they think of deer? The law, absolutely law. Right. Who are the public? Anybody you meet out in the countryside, right, who's not sure, has to be one of the public. Okay? Right. So, you know, um, you know, what do we do with these people when we meet them? You know, we treat them, right, as the way we would expect to be treated ourselves. Right. Whether we have got permission in the area, whether we think it's our God-given right to be there with a rifle to shoot the deer, right? They have also got that God-given right to be there. Right? Yeah, good stuff. We're at the LDNS Competence Awareness Day for Urban Deer and Sensitive Area Deer Management, and uh, this is the shooting part of the day. And um, what we've got is our deer silhouette and our zeroing card for the day. The candidates in the shoot are going to shoot three shots today. They're going to have one shot into the zeroing target from 100 metres, they're then going to fire from a simulated high seat at uh, 70 metres and then a standing shot from 40 metres uh, into the silhouette. So one shot into the zeroing card and two into the deer silhouette. For the scoring of this, because there's a bottle of whiskey in it today, uh, if they can get the dead centre of the, the, the zeroing target inside the diamond, they score a 10. If they break the line of that diamond, they get a 9 and anywhere else inside the circle is an 8. And for the deer silhouette itself, there's two kill zones. There's the forward kill zone, which represents uh, an immobilising shot, uh, a shot that's lethally proficient, but puts the deer down on the spot. The sort of shot we would use when a deer's in a, a sensitive area that, where it may run onto a road or off boundary and cause problems that way. And the rear section, uh, zone two, is the, the heart and lung section that we would use in normal situations like a deer's out in the open field and it may have a short run out before it uh, collapses. Uh, for shooting the forward section, there's a little circle that you won't quite make out on the camera. It's about the size of a 10 pence piece. If they get the dead centre of that, uh, that, they get a 10. If they break the line, they get a 9. And anywhere in the forward kill zones, an 8. If they go into the, the rear kill zone, into the heart and lungs, they get a 5. And because there's a bottle of whiskey on the, the line, let's hope for high scores. <laughs> this is all done with your knuckles. Pushing it away. 